So I am co-founder of a startup called Catalysis. Uh, and what we do is we, um, we, we help people monetize and keep ownership of their digital content. And we use a blockchain technology for that. Um, so we are about to close a funding round. I go quickly over Catalysis, and then we can move on to some tech stuff. Uh, we're about to close a funding round, so we're quite happy about this. Uh, we are also uh, actively looking for uh, developers. So if you are, uh, or if you know people who are interested, uh, do not hesitate to talk to me. Um, so the, the angle I will uh, take today is more, uh, so as a startup wanting to provide a business uh, service uh, using blockchains, uh, how do we eventually uh, use uh, server-side Swift? Uh, I have to confess that it was a very arbitrary choice I made uh, as the, uh, the techie of the team to go for Swift. I'm still very happy about it, even if maybe uh, some people may look at me and say, why did you choose Swift? I'm still very happy about it. Um, so our tech stack is, um, so it starts sort of at the lower level where we have uh, an Ethereum blockchain or an Ethereum compatible blockchain. Uh, and I'll go a bit deeper in, in blockchains later. Uh, then on top of it, we use uh, Zevo. Um, and on top of that, we have some libraries which allows us to basically talk to the blockchain. So, uh, quick question before uh, I continue. Who knows about blockchains? Okay. Who... Uh, if I say, um, is Bitcoin or is, is, a, is, yeah, is Bitcoin a blockchain? Yes, raise your hands. <laughs> okay, um, so um, what I'll do, if I go too, uh, too slow in my blockchain uh, presentation or the part of the presentation which is blockchain, just uh, let me know. Okay, so very quickly, a blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer system secured by crypto as a cryptography, not cryptocurrencies, for those of you who think crypto is a cryptocurrency, and a consensus algorithm. Um, it enables transactions, in the case of Bitcoin, between untrusted participants, and that's an interesting aspect that we, we, we use. Um, and it is the underlying technology of Bitcoin, uh, so the most well-known implementation of a blockchain, and Ethereum, for those of you who know uh, a next-generation uh, implementation of blockchains which adds smart contracts, but we'll discuss this a little bit. Um, what you can do on a pure Bitcoin blockchain is transactions. So basically you can exchange some sort of value between two people. So the way it works is you have two people, Alice and Bob, each of them have a private key, which they keep uh, sort of uh, with themselves, which leads to a public key. And then using private public cryptography, they're able to effectively state, so Alice, for instance, wants to send some Bitcoins to Bob. She's able to state by signing the message that she wants to send X amounts of Bitcoins to Bob. She, she can sign and guarantee to the underlying system that it's really her saying, I'm happy to give some of my value to um, Mr. Bob. Um, so what then happens is all the transactions are uh, packed into a block, and that's why it's called blockchain. These transactions are packed into a block. A hash is calculated, so I'm sure all of you know what a hash is. Uh, you add timestamp, you add the previous state, and then you calculate a new hash. And that leads to the starting point for the next block. And basically, you continue to do this ad vitam aeternum. The, th the reason I put mining here is mostly because this process uh, costs in terms of CPU power. So in the case of Bitcoin, it's called mining, and you get compensated for it by getting some fractions of Bitcoin. How does it work? Uh, it actually works as a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and what the way you get uh, this trust uh, on a blockchain network is because you end up uh, agreeing on a state using consensus. So the, can the consensus, uh, Algorithms are more or less complicated. A very simplistic one that doesn't work is uh, the majority agrees that uh, they get to the same results when they calculate this new state, the hash I, I talked about here. So 
So there are other algorithms such as uh, BFTs, Byzantine Fault Tolerance, which basically uh, account for the network connections between the node being very unreliable, uh, potentially uh, bad actors who effectively want to try to steal uh, the money or steal the value, which effectively means change the states in each of the blocks and make it look as if uh, previous transaction or transactions have happened. Any questions about blockchains? High level. No? Okay. The way um, we end up looking at a blockchain, actually, is we separate it into three big parts. Uh, so the first top layer part is the signature uh, system, in a way. Um, that's what uh, allows uh, each node of a blockchain to, um, to be comfortable that you're really who you say you are. Um, the second node is a state engine. So in the case of Bitcoin, which is mostly exchanging value, it's very simple states. Uh, it's how, much, how many Bitcoins do you own uh, and you tie to a specific address. It's a bit like accounting. And the lower level is the consensus engine. The consensus engine for Bitcoin in particular, it's using something called proof of work, which is extremely inefficient for those of you who, who have heard about these discussions. Uh, it's consuming a lot of energy. But the newer blockchain use something called proof of stake or some other derivatives. And uh, it's much more efficient in terms of uh, computations. So all of this leads to some very interesting properties, which is why we want to use it. So it leads to an immutable state going forward. Uh, so if you want, it's a bit like a database to which you just add rows. Um, and if you want to uh, change a row, you basically add it or add the row on top of, of, of itself. So you can see all the history. Uh, it's transparent because it's a completely distributed system. Uh, so everyone has a copy of the data of the states. Uh, it's decentralized, obviously, because it's peer-to-peer. It's -peer. And through uh, the use of uh, public-private key uh, crypto, you have some sort of anonymity. It's not anonymity, it's pseudonymity, i.e. if uh, it's a bit like a Swiss bank account. Once you know, uh, or once people know about uh, your, the, your Swiss bank account number, then yeah, they'll know forever, basically. And you can't really change that. So everything I talked about before was mostly about uh, Bitcoin cell blockchains, i.e. not you cannot do much other than uh, exchange value. You can store a little bit of data on it, but not that much. Um, fast forward uh, a few years after the, the original Bitcoin blockchain was re released, and uh, a guy named Vitalik uh, Buterin came up with this great idea that you could also store codes on the blockchain. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that the state part, uh, which was, I think, in red in my previous diagram, also allows you to store code and store ways to call that code, right? So for those of you who have done assembly in the far, far past, it's basically the same type of principle. You, you end up being able to store, uh, so you have a data stack, you have a code stack, and then uh, you, you, can, you can run some code. Um, the, so a language was uh, designed uh, to run on top of that blockchain. It's called Solidity. It's very similar to JavaScript. And the reason that uh, a new language was designed is because to be able to reach consensus, you need to be able to all calculate the same hash value um, at the end of the, the block turn. And to do this, if you include randomness, then your nodes are basically very unlikely to reach consensus. So it's very important, and that's the main reason why a new language was, was pushed originally, um, that every, uh, every, every code that you run is, um, is completely uh, deterministic. So in the way you would store the, the, the information on the blockchain, this side is mostly a simple, let's say it's a simple transaction. So basically you're just storing a, 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 lo a, a location to, to which you want to send X number of, uh, let's say, Bitcoins. In the case of smart contracts, you also store codes and you store some pointers to, um, 
to some data, uh, some states, which is specifically tied to instances of contracts, which are equivalent to objects. Um, and then the Ethereum virtual machine can just run that code and change the states. So effectively with smart contract blockchain, you're able to change the states of the blockchain using code, which can be very interesting. A problem is that uh, all of this uh, is, or at least in the, the existing implementation, is effectively implemented as a, as a single sort of program. So it's extremely monolithic. And the problem with this is that if you're not necessarily interested, for instance, in the way the state engine is, and maybe if you're not interested in the way the virtual machine is implemented, um, then you still have to carry it. And what we noticed is that uh, blockchain as a system is actually a very inefficient data store. So extremely slow. So it has some very interesting properties because you can make sure, especially if you're, you're, you're talking about uh, handing over some value. So it could be a cryptocurrency from one person to another and the two people do ne not necessarily trust each other. Maybe they're in different countries. Then it's very interesting because you can make sure that this transaction is um, is effectively recorded and that neither side can basically say, oh no, I didn't do the transaction. However, it's extremely inefficient. Um, and if you want to build something with uh, more interesting logic, then suddenly uh, beyond a prototype, it's actually pretty difficult. So fortunately, some companies are looking at this and are starting to try to chop up these different uh, levels uh, or dif different uh, archi architectural parts. Uh, Pendiment is one of them, and um, we actually use their implementation of Ethereum, um, which allows us, at least in the short term, to be able to use exactly the same code that we, was, we would use on Ethereum, but uh, knowing that we can move to an architecture which is much more flexible uh, in, the, in the longer term. So effectively, the, the two things you can do with Ethereum, uh, with Tendermint, sorry, is either you use their implementation of Ethereum, and in which case uh, you can go directly from uh, calling Ethereum to calling Ethermint, or you can effectively customize the whole top and only use the, um, the, the consensus engine that they, they provide. And for those of you who are interested in blockchain, I <coughs> strongly recommend to go and check out what Tendermint does. It's, uh, it's really, really interesting. Now, the main problem is that all of this is written in Go. Um, and yeah, as I said, I made a, a call very early on that I wanted to do Swift. Um, so this is where Zevo comes in. Um, so I've used um, Zevo for almost two years now. Uh, and I looked at the different frameworks at the time. Uh, and at least from my perspective, it looked like the, the most interesting framework to allow me to access uh, blockchain nodes uh, and serve some data back to uh, my clients. Um, so at the time and still for now, the clients are web-based. Um, though when we did start the project with Uline, who used to work with us, uh, it was, there was an iOS client. Um, but the idea is still that eventually we want to have uh, clients to all of th these things we're building on iOS or on, uh, on definitely on mobiles. Um, so Zevo at the time looked like a good, uh, a, a, a good uh, um, uh, idea. So you know the guy, yeah. <laughs> this is a picture I stole from from Paolo's uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter account. So he, yeah, he has a picture with uh, Chris Lattner. And so with the guy on the right is uh, Paolo. So he's based in, uh, in Brazil and he's the, yeah, Ze Zevo, in, in, from what I've seen from, from history, I guess, is his brainchild. So what is it? Um, it doesn't claim to be a framework like Vapor, Perfect, Kitura. Uh, 
it aims or it claims to be just lightweight libraries for web application in Swift. And um, so this is a quick, this is uh, the latest uh, version of Zevo, which is actually super lean and much leaner than one that you could find uh, maybe a year ago. Uh, because the, the move to, um, to Swift 4 uh, killed a number of libraries. So actually it's super, super, super lean these days. Maybe too lean, but that's a different thing. Um, but the, the main idea behind Zevo is that uh, they use coroutines rather than uh, multi-threading. And I guess now the debate <laughs> is probably Newt in the sense that uh, other frameworks such as Vapor are actually sort of moving in that direction and maybe the edge, uh, the original edge is not necessarily there anymore. But the main idea was that um, you shouldn't communicate by sharing memory, i.e. multi-threading, but more by, uh, you should uh, share memory uh, by communicating. And that's what Rob Pike, the co-designer of Go said. And if if you know a little bit of Go, you know that there's a heavy use of, of, of coroutines, uh, highly sort of, uh, uh, or very deep in the language. So it uses uh, coroutines instead of multi-threading. I'll go quite fast in the next <coughs> sessions. Um, so it's the, 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 the coroutine part is basically uh, embedding a library called libdil uh, into a, a Swift library called Venice. Uh, so it gives structured con uh, concurrency to, to Swift. Uh, so st structured concurrency is being able to nest coroutines and make sure that when the, 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 the parent coroutine dies, the other dies as well. Um, coroutines run on single CPU core. I mean, that's, uh, yeah, uh, they must yield. Uh, otherwise, there's no concurrency. It's just, it just blocks. Um, and all the blocking functions are implemented in libdil so that they, uh, they yield, such as network access or file access. So that's an example I took from, um, from a, a test case in Venice. Now, all of this, uh, basically, but we still, as a company, we still want to solve a problem. Uh, and our problem was to uh, be able to interact uh, with a blockchain node from Swift. So we've built uh, two things. Um, so the top one is basically a, a wrapper around a, a Zevo server that allows us to, uh, to call uh, most of the uh, uh, Ethereum JSON RPC calls, uh, including generating transactions and signing. So on the server side, you can, you can use uh, the JavaScript libraries, of course, if you want to. But the idea here is that this you can also compile on iOS, for instance. Uh, so this, we think, is, uh, is very interesting. Uh, so that's if you stay in the Ethereum world. And if you go into a lower level world, whereby you only want to use the um, consensus algorithm, then uh, you, you need to use uh, what the Tendermint guys called ABCI, uh, which is basically, uh, I think it stands for um, Application Blockchain Interface, uh, which basically allows you to call the lower level consensus engine and, um, and, and engage with it so that you, can ju you don't need to use uh, the state engine that uh, Ethereum provides. So the first uh, solution is basically you have a process, uh, uh, an external process that calls directly an Ethereum uh, nodes. Um, and for those of you who are a little bit into Ethereum, uh, there's a, um, a JavaScript library called Web3. Uh, so the, the library we have implements most of these calls. So in Swift, it looks somewhat like this. Uh, so there are a few libraries you import, and then you generate a key with a private, uh, a private seed, um, and then you just instantiate uh, a, a connection to uh, a blockchain node, which in this case is on a local host, and then, um, yeah, you can just generate a transaction. So this is a very simple transaction. It just sends value from 
the address that instantiated the blockchain to the address that's been defined underneath. The other, the other uh, option that we have, so right now we only have the libraries and it, it's actually not really stable yet, is to, con to, to communicate directly to the consensus engine. Um, so then instead of um, using a, a, a very high level uh, call to the blockchain, what you end up doing is you need to implement um, uh, these functions. So each of these are a very, very low level abstraction of what happens when you effectively uh, get transactions uh, from the different, uh, for, yeah, that you, uh, to a blockchain node that you end up packaging into a hash. And, um, and then you make sure that you then send back that information to the uh, consensus engine, and then you're able to build your, um, your blocks. This solution requires that you manage the state yourself which means that you probably also want to have a very good way to manage how you can guarantee that anything that happens in your states, uh, you can check it. Uh, so it's, it's quite involved. But the, the upside of doing this is that you can then have much more performance because you do not have to carry all the uh, um, Ethereum virtual machine uh, layer uh, which in effect is quite slow. Uh, and if you want to implement a specific applications like we do, then a lot of it we don't really care about. The other good thing is that you can implement this in Swift and not in Solidity. So the current status. Um, so most of the building blocks are there. They're actually open source. So whoever is interested in looking at them, uh, feel free. Um, an earlier implementation of the Ethereum blockchain by, uh, library is open source already, uh, but to be very honest, it hasn't been touched for a while. Um, and we are uh, thinking of open sourcing the Ethereum blockchain and the ABCI Swift libraries uh, at some point in the future. Uh, for now, we don't really have time to dedicate to making it uh, clean. But uh, if you're really interested, uh, yeah, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to talk to us and then we see what we can do. All of the codes is, that we have is on GitLab, or at least the, the one that is uh, open sourced. Uh, feel free to check. Uh, recap, this is our stack. So the, we just talked about our stack. Um, then Zevo underneath, if you want to go and check it out. Um, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of Vapor, uh, but <laughs> still it's, a, it's, it's in, an interesting implementation. And then below is more blockchain specific stuff. Almost like side, so as I said, we're hiring. So if you're interested, do not hesitate. And if there are any questions, I would be happy to take them. So what is the purpose of make? What do we make? Product? So our product is a combination of a blockchain with, um, right now still with smart contracts that allows us to, um, to basically keep track of micropayments um, in fiat currencies. We do not use cryptocurrencies. And uh, whenever you, are, uh, you pay for some online content, basically, we also we distribute that, uh, yeah, that value back to the owner or owners, because you can basically register your content with, with multiple owners. Uh, no, because our business model is transaction fee based. Uh, and we realize that um, if you do transaction fees, you want a minimum amount of volume. And ebooks are not exchanged or resold. That was the, the, the use case at the time, uh, that often. Uh, so we moved more to, um, to journalists. Uh, and there's a number of freelance journalists who have blogs or. Uh, whatever, and some of them are able to monetize, but some others are not. Uh, so we're basically pushing in this direction. We're also starting to, looking, uh, to look at scientific publishing, uh, which is a little bit different to, uh, to, to the, the, the core uh, business of, of, um, of journalists. 
But uh, yeah, there may, may some also be some interesting applications of a blockchain uh, layer uh, in that space. It's a very good question, but uh, let's say the main problem with blockchains, uh, especially public blockchains, is that um, you effectively end up not only storing your own code, but also storing other people's code and running other people's code. So it compounds the problem of being slow, of being uh, potentially... Um, I mean, being inefficient, that's for sure, but also being exposed to uh, some guy, so a bug, and then some guy just trying some things and breaking everything, and then you need to revert to a previous state, uh, which happened a few times already. Um, so personally, I don't see the current implementations of blockchains, such as Ethereum, as nestle the end states of blockchains, because it's great to prototype, it's great to add... Uh, a lot of, uh, or to multiply your market capitalization by two or three, uh, as happened if you add blockchain to your name for a few companies. But other than that, uh, if you want to run it as a system that will then serve customers and you want to be up and running for, let's say, 99.999% of the time, it doesn't really <coughs> work. Uh, let's say they're not called viruses, but they're able to siphon a lot of money away from the people who are supposed to hold the money. Uh, I hmm? Great system. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that, that's why it, it's, I mean, blockchain has very interesting properties, but the current implementations allow you to do a prototype, um, but that's it. Uh, then, in my opinion, you need to go much lower and in most cases, you implement a solution, but you do not care that someone is able to write any code on top of whatever you've added. Actually, you don't want that. Uh, you prefer to protect access to your node. More questions? Thank you, Alex. Thank you.